weeks ago I took a break from my usual pretentious video essays that I make and decided to do a more practical tutorial about Photoshop and I got such a positive response from it, so many people saying they found it really helpful that I decided to just knock out another one because I've got loads of these tips. So here are 25 more Photoshop tips, tricks, hacks and techniques for you. So in keeping with the tradition set up by my last video, before we jump into tip number one, I'm going to show you something weird and pointless that Photoshop can do. And this one is in your interface settings in your preferences. So on a PC, you go to edit and preferences or on a Mac, you go to Photoshop, preferences and interface. So here in your appearance box, you can select your color theme and you can change how dark or light the interface is. But if you hold Alt and Shift or Option Shift on a Mac, when you click these, these turn into toast. But if you're not happy with toast, if you hold command or control on PC, they turn into coffee. And like the banana tool in the last video, I have absolutely no idea what the point of this is. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is a feature called Droplets. And this is a feature that creates a little icon that you can keep on your desktop or in a folder somewhere and it will apply a Photoshop action to files simply by dragging them to that icon without having to go into Photoshop and go to automate and all that normal stuff. So let me show you how this works. So in Photoshop, you go to file and to automate and create droplet and it'll bring up this dialog box. So under this section here entitled play, we have a list of all the actions that I've created and I've created a set called Photoshop tips. And within that, I'm going to select this action here called Instagram. And this is an action I've set up that will resize my images and put a board around them, how I like to have them when I upload to Instagram. So I'm going to send that to my desktop and I'm going to click OK. So if I go to my desktop, I've got this little icon here that is the droplet and it's called Instagram. I've got this folder called portraits for Instagram here and here we can see all my portraits. They're all very large and they are not ready for Instagram yet. But all I need to do now is drag this portraits for Instagram folder to this droplet icon and you can see these resizing. So now I've applied that action to that whole folder without having to go into Photoshop and do loads of stuff. And I can just keep that on my desktop and every time I want an image for Instagram, I can just drag the folder or the image to that droplet and it will create something Instagram ready for me. So this next one's a nice little one and it's how to identify a font in an image. So I'm just gonna take this EasyJet image here and to make the type a bit more legible, I'm going to crop it using the perspective crop tool. Then we go to the type menu and go match font and it brings up this little dialog box here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag this around here and here we go, Cooper Black, which is the font there. And you can download that from the Adobe Cloud and use it in your image. So this next one is to be used sparingly. It's quite destructive and it's quite temperamental, but if you're just doing a quick mock-up of something, it's a really quick way to change the color of something. This is the color replacement brush. So say you want to change this EasyJet orange to something like blue like that or something. I'm just gonna cycle through my brushes by Shift and B. This is the color replacement brush. I'm just gonna make my brush a bit bigger and I'm just gonna paint in the orange areas here and you can see that is nicely changing that to blue and that's done. So this next one is something I do that I find makes my layers easier to navigate. So when you've got a document like this, I've got all these W's here and they're all on separate layers and the default Photoshop view just shows it like this. But if you go to this little icon here and go to panel options, what you can do is you can firstly change the thumbnail size, but secondly, and more importantly, I think, is you can change the thumbnail contents to layer bounds. And what that will do is crop the thumbnail of the layer to only the contents of the layer and not the whole layer. So it makes it much easier to see what's going on. Of course, you can change these options as you go to best suit the document you're working on, but this is my personal preference I find for most documents. So number five is a way I like to fix skin tones in Photoshop. And this is a variation on the matching colors with curves that I did in the last video. So let me show you how this works. So here we've got an image from a wedding I shot. It's not the best image, but it shows well the problem we had on this double-decker bus. They had this beautiful old Routemaster bus, but it had this horrible, very greeny yellow fluorescent ceiling that was bouncing off onto everyone's skin and giving them a horrible greeny yellow tone on their skin. So a good way to fix this is to go and add a curves layer. 
And as before, we've got to make sure we select the curves, not the mask. And we're going to double click this mid-tone eyedropper. So I can pick an area of skin tone. And one important thing to mention here is that you must make sure the sample size isn't just a point sample. Five by five or 11 by 11 average is good because that takes an average of a group of pixels. So I'm going to click here. And here we have our skin tone taken from here. So now what you wanna do is edit this color to a better skin tone. And this is tip number six. And this is using Photoshop as a calculator. So if you read around a lot about skin retouching and getting the perfect skin tone, a kind of rough rule of thumb is that the magenta should be twice what the cyan is and the yellow should be two and a half times what the cyan is. And that's not what we've got here. So the cyan is probably a little much because of all this green. So I'm going to just take that down to maybe down to maybe 14. So this is the maths bit. So we want magenta to be twice 14. So I'm going to do 14 times two. And it's going to give me 14 times two. And the yellow, we want to be two and a half times the cyan. So we're going to do 14 times 2.5. And that's going to give me 14 times 2.5. And so this is our new improved skin tone. So do I want to save this as a default? I'm going to click no because I'm only doing this once. I'm going to click back in the same area. And that has changed our skin tone. It's a little bit magenta -y, So I'm going to click back in here. And I'm going to take the magenta just down by a little bit. So that's taking just a little bit of that magenta out of the skin tone. So that's where we were. And that's where we are now. And that is a much better skin tone. So this next tip, number seven, is how to get a much better shadow and highlight feature in Photoshop. And for some reason, Photoshop doesn't seem to prioritize shadow and highlight very highly. Not like it does in Lightroom, because in Lightroom, it's right there in the, that first box. It's right there with your exposure and your contrast and everything. And it's generally something people change quite a lot. And in Photoshop, it's hidden away in the image menu and in adjustments. There's not even any shortcut key for it or anything. So anyway, here is an image I took at a wedding it's a bride and a groom. I took them out on the beach as the sun was just about to set and they are dramatically underexposed here. Um, and then all the detail in the sky is quite bright. So if we bring up the exposure, we're gonna lose detail in the sky. And if we bring it down to get the detail in the sky, we're gonna lose them. So you would normally go to your shadows and highlights. So we go to image adjustments and shadows and highlights. And it brings up this little dialogue here a shadow slider and a highlight slider. But if I do that, it looks absolute rubbish. It looks like one of those horrible HDR things. So what you do here is click show more options. And then you're presented with all these other options. And the key one here is radius. Now tone affects how much of the image it classes as shadows and how much of the tone it classes as highlights. The amount is how much it raises it by and the radius is the feathering around each pixel by which it will apply the effect. So if you want to soften that effect down a little bit, just pull out the radius and then we can recover the shadows and the highlights without it going to that horrible HDR look. And we have a much better, much more natural looking image. But of course, there's another way to do this, and this is tip number eight. A lot of you will know this, but some of you might not, and this is the select subject option. So to get this option, you need to go to your magic wand tool or your quick selection tool. And when you do that, you'll notice this select subject button has appeared. Select that, and it's given us a marquee around what it thinks of the subject. And there's a little bit missing here, so we just fill that in and we've got a selection of our subjects and eight or nine times out of 10, that will work pretty well. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to a curves layer and because I had a selection, it's automatically made that a mask. And I'm gonna bring them up in exposure wise and to avoid any sort of rough edges, I'm just gonna feather that mask by a good bit there. And that's a nice quick simple way just to raise the exposure on your subjects a little bit. So this next tip number nine is for files like this, where you have a very large file with lots and lots of layers in. So if I open this up normally, it takes a little while because you've got to think about it and it's got loads and loads of layers. I mean, I've got a pretty fast computer, so that opened relatively fast. But if you've got a slower computer, this is what you can do. If you just want to open it without all the layers and you just want to have a flattened image, you hold Shift and Option or Alt and Shift on the PC 
click open and then you get this dialog box asking you if you want to read the composite data instead. You click OK and it quickly just opens just a flattened version of that image. So now I've reopened the layered version of this, and this is tip number 10, using blend modes with adjustment layers. So I've got this image here, but I'd like a little bit more contrast in it. So I'm going to add a new curves layer. So I'm going to put a point here and I'm going to crush the black slightly and just lift up those lights slightly. But with this contrast curve, whilst adding contrast to the darks and lights, it's also increased the saturation and I don't want that. I would like to get the saturation from this version of the image but with this extra contrast. So what I do here is I go to my blending modes whilst on the curves layer and I go to luminosity and what that does is it only applies the darks and lights and leaves the colours alone. And I can just pull that back a little bit because I think it's a little bit much. There we go, it's got a little bit of punch there but the colours have remained as saturated as I want them. So number 11, nice simple one, and this is good for when you finish doing a massive big document like this and you want to just save it as a layered version in case you need to come back and change something. So often when you finish, you've got all these layers that you didn't end up using. Some of them are hidden away in loads of folders and the document is much bigger than it needs to be because it's got all these unused layers. Rather than going through one by one and finding where they are, you just go layer, delete, hidden layers. And that will just delete all the layers that you're not using and then you can save a streamlined version of your layered Photoshop file. So tip number 12 is another one for a big layered file like this. If you hold Shift Option Command E or Shift Control Alt E on a PC, what happens is it creates a new layer at the top of your document that's a flattened version of all the visible layers below it. So tip number 13, if I wanted to maybe just take his head here and just copy that to a new document as a flattened version, I don't need to flatten anything, I just need to go to edit and copy merge. And if I create a new document and paste there, there we have a flattened version of that selection. So number 14 is a very useful one, and this is perspective warp. So say I've got an image of these films here and I've got another film that I want to place with it, but I've taken it at the wrong angle. For this, you go to Edit, Perspective Warp. And what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to draw a box here and I'm going to move these pins just to the edges of one of the sides here. And then I'm going to do the same over here. And if you notice, these have gone grey, that will snap. I'm going to put that there. Move this in slightly. And then we're going to do another one from up here. I'm going to move this down to here. That's going to snap there. And then that's going to snap there. So what we do now is we change this from layout to warp. And now we can warp our box here. Now I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to click the tick here and it's going to just apply that there. I'm going to put this down here. I'm just going to add a shadow. We've gone from that to that. And this doesn't just have to be done on objects, it can be done on scenes as well. Edit, Perspective Warp, I'm going to go from the corner here. I'm just going to lift that up. What you want to be wary of is that these lines here are running parallel to whatever's on the image. So you can kind of see there that that's, that's about right. So you're going to go from this corner and that should snap and then Go down to about there. So I'm now going to click the warp button again. And if you hold shift and click the intersecting lines, then you can move two points together and it will straighten the lines. This is obviously quite an extreme example, but you can do this in a lot more subtle ways just to match up perspectives on an image you've taken, just tweak things slightly. It's a very useful feature. So on the subject of perspective, tip number 15 is the vanishing point feature. So here, if we have a building like this and we want to maybe clone stamp it up or you can do it on a pavement or a row of buildings or anything that has any sort of perspective in it, you go to filter and vanishing point. And now this dialog box opens. The grid tool is automatically selected. So I'm going to draw a grid to match the perspective of the building. 
Now that I've drawn that, I can grab these side points here and extend them out. And Photoshop will extend the grid, but it, it'll extend it proportionally to the perspective plane of the building. And now I'm going to select this tool, which is the clone stamp. Now if I Alt or Option click here, you can see as I'm moving the cursor around, the preview is adjusting the perspective to the perspective of the building. So I can clone in more building like this. And you can choose whether it's a regular clone stamp or a healing brush, etc. And this is a very useful feature for extending buildings or roads or any flat planes that have a perspective in them. So this is tip number 16 and it's an easier way to use the drop shadow. So what I've got here is I've got a gradient and I've just typed the word YouTube. If I double click the layer, it'll bring up the drop shadow dialog box. And rather than going around with your angle and messing around with all these controls here, you can just go straight to the document and drag it around. It's a little bit easier to position it. But the drop shadow is very limited and tip number 17 is how to use it on a 3D plane. So let me show you. So now I've created that drop shadow, I'm going to right click it and go to create layer. And what this has done is it's created its own layer that is just the drop shadow on its own. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to Command T or Control T to free transform this. So I'm just holding Command or Control on a PC and I'm just moving these handles to get a bit of a perspective look to this. And there we have our 3D drop shadow. Because of course once you've created a layer, you can do whatever you want to it. You can change the blur with the field blur, you can stretch it, warp it, do whatever. Of course the major downside to this is it's a much more destructive way of doing it. Um, you can always create a smart object once you've created the layer so you can always reset all your, your transformations but the drop shadow itself is kind of locked in. But it gives you a lot more scope to create different effects with the drop shadow. So tip number 18 is displacement maps. And this is useful for something like this where you've got a t-shirt and it's got wrinkles and creases and you want to maybe put a YouTube logo on it. So one of the many things you may do is reduce the saturation of that logo slightly. Then you may want to add a multiply layer to it. But when you zoom in, it's not moving with the creases. It's just flat on. So this is where we use a displacement map. So I've created a displacement map for this t-shirt image. And it's very simple. It's basically just a black and white image saved as a PSD. So this is it here. This is our displacement map. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the layer I want to apply the displacement map to, which is the logo. I'm going to go to Filter and Distort and Displace. So first of all, it's going to ask me how much I want to displace it by. 10 pixels is the default, so we're going to try that. And then it's going to ask me for my displacement map, and this is it here. So watch this. Anything that's black in the displacement map won't move, and anything that's white will move by 10 pixels as I asked it to, and anything that's in between will move by that relative amount. So that's quite a lot of movement there. So if I'm gonna I'll double click this and maybe go down to six, six pixels, see what that does. Displacement map, this t-shirt, there we go. There we go, that's probably better. I was just picking up the texture there just a little bit and it's just going up on that crease there. And it looks much more realistic than that. So tip number 19 is the content aware scale. So here I've got a picture of a wall and a picture of a frame and a picture of the word content aware scale. Now I want to fit this frame around that word to make it look like the word is framed. So if I was to just free transform it like normal, what would happen is it would look like that, which is obviously stretched and it just doesn't look very good at all. So instead of Command or Control T to get you to a free transform, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a content aware scale. And that is Shift, Option, Command and C or Shift, Alt, Control and C on a PC. Now watch the difference now. If I pull this out, the proportions of this frame are being maintained because Photoshop is using some algorithms to work out what it thinks is important detail that shouldn't be stretched and what it thinks it can stretch without being detrimental to the image and it's doing a pretty good job here with this frame. So tip number 20, and this is targeting specific tones on a tone curve by clicking the image. 
and this is how you do it. So I've got this image here and I'm going to turn it black and white and I've added a contrast curve. I'm going to click this little hand tool, the targeted adjustment tool, and I'm going to slide down maybe that bit there, but then I'm going to want maybe this skin tone to be a bit lighter and maybe this is a bit bright and I want that to come down. You see every time I'm clicking, there's a point added to the graph. So obviously the more you do it, the more complex it's going to get and the more difficult it's going to get. But we're adding contrast here and we can be specific about how we want that contrast to look. But this is a very good way of targeting specific tones in your images and making sure that they are lightened or darkened exactly how you want them. And then you end up with a complex kind of tone curve like this that you probably wouldn't have drawn if you were just trying to place the points yourself. And this also can be done on a black and white adjustment layer like this. I can target specific colors. And doing this with the black and white panel is especially useful when you're working in black and white because you may not remember what all the colors of everything are. So you may not remember what color that jumper was or what color that book is behind her. But with the targeted adjustment tool, you don't need to worry about that. You simply just click it and drag and you can see the adjustments in real time. So this is tip number 21 and this is how to make selections with calculations. Okay, so calculations are a little complex, but I'll try and explain it as clearly as I can. It basically is a feature that uses the channels in order to help make selections and cut out complex elements. For example, this image here has a lot of complex edges where the trees meet the sky. And if we go to our channels, we have a red, green, and a blue channel. So the red doesn't show much contrast, the green shows a little bit more contrast, but the blue channel, this shows a lot of contrast. And this means that we can use that information in this blue channel to help make an accurate mask to cut around all the trees. So we access calculations by going image and then calculations. And this dialog box will open. And basically what you have is you have two channels that are mixed together with a blending mode that you choose. And then you can tell it whether you want to output it to a new channel or a selection or a new document. I'm gonna change this to selection so I can make a mask out of it. So imagine source two as the bottom layer and imagine source one as the top layer and then the blending mode is applied to that top layer. So because we know the blue channel has the most contrast, I'm going to put blue over blue. So the three blending modes you're probably going to use most are multiply and add and subtract. Now what we want here is we want the sky to be dark and the trees to be light. So we're going to invert both of these channels. So there we go. That's basically just made a negative of that image. But when you invert one channel over another channel, you can get some quite interesting and clever selections with this. Now multiply as a blend mode isn't quite doing enough here. So I'm going to go to add to see what that does. Now that has given us almost a nice solid white here by a few areas, but it's made the sky a lot lighter. So I'm going to fiddle around with the offset and the offset is basically where the base point of your darks and lights come from. So if I increase the number, the image will get lighter. So if I make it 100, the image will get lighter. But I can do a negative number, minus 100, and the image gets darker. But where it was going to complete white, you still have more information above that. So what we found now is that we're getting a very good contrast between these edges here. And that's kind of exactly what we want, this minus 100. So I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to click the Mask tool. Now I'm going to Option or Alt click the mask and now we can edit the mask. So first of all, I'm just going to pick the lasso tool and I'm just going to draw very roughly around just to get darks and lights in the areas we need them. Because I've got black as my foreground color, I can click Option Delete or Alt Delete and that will fill that area with that color. So now I'm going to select some of the whites with the lasso tool and I'm just going to go around like this and to reverse this, I'm just going to press X and then Option or Alt Delete again, just to make that white. So what we need to do now is just tidy up this edge a little bit and make sure we've got a nice contrast. So I'm gonna to go to my brush tool, and this is a clever bit. 
with the white selected, I'm going to change the blending mode of the brush to overlay. And when I draw on here now, it's just gonna raise some of those lights, but it's not gonna to touch the darks. And if I switch it around to black, and I draw on here, anything that is under 50% brightness will go down to black, and anything that is over, it won't touch. So now we have a nice mask there. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate this layer by Command J or Control J on a PC. I'm gonna select that mask on the bottom layer. I'm gonna right click it and delete that layer mask. So now we can do things like select this dinosaur and paste it in here. And we can have a dinosaur emerging above our trees. Or we could grab another sky image. We can paste that sky in. And then now we've got a different sky behind there. Anyway, that's a very useful feature. It's a very powerful one. And it's a little bit complicated, but it's worth checking out. This is tip number 22, and this is how to smooth out a background. So I took this portrait here, and I was using a pop-up background, but it's got a few creases in it that you can kind of see. I'll add a curves layer here, just so you can see that texture in it a bit more. So a nice, quick, easy way I found of fixing this is to click on your magic wand tool or your direct selection and go select subject. Now I want to expand that selection a little bit, uh, maybe by 50 pixels that depend, depend on what your image is. Now I'm going to invert that selection and I'm going to command or control J to make a new layer. And then I'm going to command or control click that layer to make a selection of that layer. I'm gonna make a mask of that layer and I'm gonna unlink those. Right, you with me? Okay, then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna click this and I'm gonna blur it. This is the reason we unlinked them because if I blur it while they're linked, the mask will blur as well. So I'm gonna add a Gaussian blur until all that detail has gone. I think around there. What's happened there is we've got our mask kind of protecting our subject. We can always feather that slightly if it looks it's looking a bit harsh. And then we've got a layer kind of that's smooth that's kind of blurring back into the texture just around the edge but because it's only a tiny bit you don't really notice it. And then we've got our subject there so I can now apply that texture and we've got a smooth background. So this is tip number 23 and it's using calculations again, but it's a little bit simpler. It's more kind of feeling your way through it. And this is how to create dramatic black and whites using calculations. So this is another image from the same shoot. And if we wanted to create a black and white version of this, we could just add a black and white layer and maybe tweak the curves a little bit. But you know, that's limited. What we do have is we have our channels here. We have different kind of levels of contrast. We've got red where the skin's very soft and light. We've got blue where the skin's very textured, green somewhere in the middle. So we go to image and calculations, and then we can change our mode to something like overlay, and we can just have a fiddle around with the different channels until we find something that's working nicely. Green over, this is, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Blue over green. It's, nice and dramatic. Maybe that's a little bit harsh, maybe take it down to 80% opacity. And we change the result to a new document. So that simply takes that image and makes a new document here. But look how brilliantly dramatic that is. And it's not over sharpened, but you've got so much detail there. So because this is an alpha channel now, we're gonna change it to grayscale, and then I'm gonna change that from grayscale to RGB so we can work with it. But that is a very nice interpretation of that, I think. And that's a nice sort of simple way to get some really dramatic effects. So have a play around with that because that's probably one of my favorite ways of creating black and white images. So this next tip is tip number 24, and this is the frame tool. So I've got an image here, it's uh, 1080 by 1080, it's Instagram size, and I've got some guides up here. If I hit K, I get to my frame tool. This is tool here. I'm gonna draw a frame here. I'm gonna draw another one here. So if I say this is a PSD, I can use this as a template. I can just drag in any image I want to into the frame. 
Once you've selected the layer, you double click to select between moving the image within the frame and moving the frame itself. That's a nice little way to make templates if you want to do things like Instagram or magazine spreads or anything like that. So number 25 it uses the new features that they've just released in the updates to the warp tool. This is 2019, it's November at the moment, so it's that recent update if you're watching this at another time. But this is how to protect an area when you're warping an image. So. We have this image of a woman sat on a rock here and we've got a load of text here that we're going to put as an article on why she likes to sit on rocks. And the problem is, is that she's not ideally placed for this text. It's going over her face, the text becomes legible. What would be nice if she was kind of just moved out here. So we just need to warp the image a bit. So if we were to hit Command or Control T to get to the free transform, then click this icon here it'll change to the warp tool and you know we could move her over but what happens is she starts to get stretched and it don't look good so what you do is you hold alt or option and you get this little crosshair I'm just going to draw a box around her like that to the floor so it's now split this into six and if I select in the middle of this box and I pull this over the proportions of whatever's in that box are being respected and everything around it is getting stretched. So I'm happy with that. So I'll click the tick and here we go. So I just noticed that this channel passed quarter of a million subscribers the other day. And thank you to everyone who subscribed and to everyone who leaves such supportive comments. Even though I might not have the time to respond to everyone personally, I want you to know that I greatly appreciate it. And thank you also to my Patreon supporters and to anyone who buys my Lightroom presets, as this is what primarily funds my channel and allows me to make the videos that I make. I have a massive list of ideas for future videos, so watch this space for lots more to come.